it's a little bit scary introducing Alison. Um, she was the lead architect for Parrot for a while, and she was on the Python Software Foundation board before it became cool to be on the board. <laughs> and she's now working on OpenStack. And she's going to be speaking to us about where this thing we call computing is going. Oh, <laughs> cool. Um, so after this talk, the day it's going to be the end of the day. We'll be starting up again tomorrow at 8.30 with coffee. Don't do what I do, did this morning, and which Andre did as well, which is miss coffee. Um, it comes back to bite you at about lunchtime. Cool. And over to Alison. Try to get this where I can uh, switch slides without hiding behind the podium too much. All right, so Simon mentioned at the very beginning that one of the most valuable things about a conference like this is that the speakers are all available. So I figured I'd, I'd start by telling you a few things, if you bump into me out in the hallway over coffee, a few things that you might want to talk to me about. Um, so I'm on the board of the Open Source Initiative, and especially I'm responsible for individual memberships. So if you're interested in being a member or if you have ideas about how to recruit members for uh, an organization like the OSI, you can come chat to me about that. Um, I work at Hewlett Packard on OpenStack and especially open source strategy around cloud technology. Um, so might be some interesting conversations there. Um, I also work on Debian and Ubuntu, and I'm interested in, in recruiting some folks to package Python modules. So if you're interested in learning about that, you might come chat with me. And there's a group of us here at the conference this week who are planning to submit a bid to host the annual Debian Developer Conference in Cape Town in 2016. So you might kind of chat with one of us <laughs> about that. All right, so in, in the past few years, I've started studying physics, um, especially quantum physics and astrophysics. Uh, this is really just for fun. Most television is boring, so you know, gotta do something. Um, so I really admire physicists um, for their, um, I would almost say their love of, of admitting mistakes, right? Like, it, it, it's not just, it's not just a virtue with them, it's, it's almost gleeful. Um, so any decent textbook on astrophysics, the very first chapter will say, once upon a time, we believed that the Earth was flat, and boy, were we wrong, just so wrong. And once upon a time, we believed that the sun rotated around the Earth. Boy, were we wrong, oh my goodness. And if you study Quantum physics, pretty much any textbook you find on it, the entire thing cover to cover is dedicated to proving how classical physics is wrong in every way imaginable. So I kind of wish that we did the same thing in software. I wish that every introductory textbook to, to computer science started with, once upon a time, we believed that all compilation would be static. And then we had languages like oh, Smalltalk and Python, which proved us utterly, utterly wrong. And once upon a time, we believed that 64K was a lot of RAM. Wow, you could do so much with 64K. And once upon a time, we believed that all computing would be single-threaded in a single process on a single machine. And boy, were we wrong, just so wrong. Um, now, I have a confession to make, and that is I'm a bit of a Unix gray beard. I realize I don't look like one, I hide it well, but I am. And so when I see words like cloud, I have a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, like ugh, ugh. I just, I don't like buzzwords. So I'm going to, I'm going to debunk the buzzword. Let, let's, let's sort of unpick cloud and see what it really is. So really, it's about two things. Networking and virtualization. So networking, all right, networking has been around since the 50s. 
So the first networked computer system was the semi-automatic ground environment. It was a collection of radar data machines that were networked so that we could um, run detection for potential threats over a much wider area of the sky at the same time, simultaneously. In the 60s, we started to get a little more generalization on this idea of networking. You see ARPANET, which is sort of like the first sort of general purpose network. Um, also in the 60s, you see the first instance of virtualization. And this is the idea that you can have a single physical machine that pretends to be multiple machines. So it sort of acts like there are several different machines running on top of it, but they're all just hosted on one physical machine underneath. In the 70s, so this is like a decade after ARPANET, uh, ARPANET finally generalized to the point that we have the first standard protocol for formatting, transmitting, and receiving packets. Before that, it was pretty much a free-for-all. And in the 80s, so like another 10 years after we first standardized TCP IP, then we got the internet. Um, it's, it's a little bit fuzzy exactly when the internet started, but it was in the 80s we started calling it the internet. And this is just really just one network, one TCP IP network. Another 10 years later, so like this technology has been around a really long time now. Um, this is when we got the World Wide Web. And this is when the technology really took off. And the reason is it was no longer just a small group of geeks in their, you know, in their caves thinking about it. This is when the internet, well, this is when cat photos came along. <laughs> <laughs> so th it was at this point that like average users could benefit from the technology. You know, they could buy books, they could, um, share their stories, um, and this is when it really took off. So in the 2000s, kind of have virtualization again, this is when you started to get things like user mode Linux and Zen and KVM, um, and like virtualization started to become a way of uh, basically resource saving in hosting the World Wide Web. Also in the 2000s, we decided that the same technology that we had already had for a decade it needed a new name. So <laughs> it was still HTML, it was still JavaScript, it was still CSS. Um, now, to be fair, uh, there was sort of a new concept of dynamicity around Web 2.0. And that was, it's not just static pages and you click a link and you go to another page and you click a link and you go to another page. It was really a sense that like the web should be interactive just like an ordinary application, um, an ordinary desktop application. So in the 2010s, we have this new buzzword, cloud. Um, uh, actually, you could technically say it started around 2006. That was when Amazon started launching their cloud stuff, but it really didn't take off until the 2010s. Um, and the cloud is, at heart, just virtualization and networking, that's it. Um, so it's, it's a different scale, right? So if you talk about virtualization in the 2000s, uh, you know, you're probably talking about 10 VMs running on a dozen servers, maybe, you know, 10 VMs on each server. So it's fairly small scale. The concept of the cloud is, is kind of a radical increase in that. So, you know, you might have 100 VMs on each machine. You might have thousands or hundreds of thousands machines of machines all working together. Um, but it's really just the same technology that we've had since the 50s and 60s with, you know, a, a set of refinements on top of it. And what's, what's kind of important to think about that is, is at that scale, you know, at, at the scale of 10 VMs on 10 machines, you can have a person, a human being, who looks at each machine individually by hand and sort of gardens them, cleans them up. Um, at the scale of like 100,000 machines in your data center, the cost of having actual human beings looking at every single server is, it's completely ridiculous. Um, and that's why you start to see things like, um, well, Ansible was one that was mentioned, but there's a whole bunch of tools. You start to see tools around automating 
interacting with servers. So it's no longer human labor. It's now the human has the brains to set up the set of scripts, the set of Ansible scripts, the set of Chef or Puppet scripts. Um, and then it's actually machines that talk to machines that talk to machines. Um, and your entire infrastructure is spun up by software rather than by human beings. All right, so that's where we've come so far. What's next? What's the next buzzword? Well, I'm a linguist, so I get to make up words. At least that's what I consider it. So next is a new word I call ubique. You pronounce it like unique, or if you prefer, you can spell it like Philip K. K. Dick's Ubique. This is a novel. Um, so it comes from uh, the la same Latin root as ubiqui ubiquitous computing. Um, it's about the concept that computing is everywhere. Um, in Latin, it means everywhere. So this is the Internet of Things. Um, it's also your smartphone, so you carry more power in your hand these days than, in fact, like a crazy supercomputer from not too long ago. Um, and, and also it's things like, so the fact of having data sims now means that you have networking just about anywhere in the world. Um, it may not be fast, it may not even be 100% reliable, but you can take it just about anywhere. So um, I'm not the only one who thinks this is what is coming. Uh, this is some research by Gartner, and they predict uh, 30 billion uh, network-connected computing devices by 2020. Now, th this is a massive, massive upshift. You know, this is so from 2009, you have about 5 billion, um, and they're predicting 30 billion by 2020. That means this is where a lot of investment is going right now. Um, is into this space. So Google Glass is one example of computing everywhere. It's a terrible example, but it's, it's a prototype. It's a horrible, clunky prototype, but it starts to give you the idea of where we could be going with you have a computing device with you integrated into your life wherever you go. Um, Fitbit is an example, something small, lightweight, fits in your pocket, just measures like your walking statistics, sort of giving you information about your health. Um, and then there's the, the areas where you can make your own Internet of Things. Uh, Arduino is a good example. It's pretty low level. Um, Raspberry Pi is another good example. There was a great talk about that today. Um, and that's at the level where you're actually l running a Linux distro and running Python, right, on your, your small device that you can carry with you anywhere. So here's why I predict this is the next exciting thing, and that is Cloud by itself is just plumbing, like the internet was just plumbing. There is nothing exciting about plumbing. Um, what's exciting is what you run on plumbing. And what the cloud gives you is very easy to automatically spin up bits of computing power that you can access from anywhere in the world. So your tiny little computing device that fits in your pocket well, it's about as powerful as a Cray supercomputer, but it can access many multiples of many times of that computing power quickly over a small data sim connection, um, which means you end up saving a lot of power on the small device. So this is why, so the Internet of Things, ubiquitous computing, uh, small bits of computing that you carry with you is what's interesting about the cloud. Cloud by itself is Boring is dirt, unless unless you happen to be one of the geeks who like gets really excited about like uh, lower powered servers and data processing and stuff like that, which actually probably most people in the room are. But <laughs> <laughs> so, why should you care about cloud? You know, I I give a talk somewhat like this. I've given it at Debian conferences, Apache conferences. I've given it a whole bunch of different places. Um, and a lot of people in the open source community, I find, uh, are turned off by buzzwords like cloud um, because, yeah, it's just a buzzword. It's not all that interesting. And the fact of the matter is you do need to care. Um, and the reason you need to care is because this is where Python is heading as well. So one example 
um, you may know that OpenStack is one of the, the largest open source cloud computing platforms, um, and it is all written in Python. So if you're not a GUI person and you're interested in interesting, exciting jobs in Python, OpenStack is actually a really good place to go right now. There's a lot of companies hiring for it. Uh, Python is a great language for the server. Um, and more and more these days, you'll find that um, servers in the cloud are running Linux. Most of those Linux distros have Python installed by default. Um, so Python is a very, and Python is a very light language, lightweight, rapid startup language. Um, so these are some stats on Linux. Um, and if you take a look at that, so the largest blue slice there is Ubuntu. Um, the red one is generic Linux, and you'll see uh, various other Linux distros in there. But if you add it all up, Linux is 90% of the cloud instances launched, um, which is a really big opportunity for Python. Python is a good language for the client. Again, because it's small and lightweight, you can run, you can run Python on your Raspberry Pi, you can run Python on your, you know, as computing devices get smaller and smaller, you can run Python on it little machine. Um, and there's evidence that Python is, in fact, um, holding its place. So over the past year, Python has held number eight in the Toyobi index, um, as other languages have, have dropped down. Um, so why is Python such a great language for the cloud? So a lot of it comes down to just very basic concepts of free software. So one aspect of that is the, the sort of the philosophy, the philosophy of free software. Um, so you have the concept of development in the open, uh, which means that people have very easy access to the language. Um, you have licensing that's very friendly to just about anything you might want to use Python for. Um, and like the whole concept of free software, of giving away the software for free, is a lot of what's driven the fast pace of innovation on the internet because people didn't have to pay, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars just to sort of get in the door of, of doing development. They could, in their garage, they could just pull up their laptop and quickly put together some Twitter or whatever and then launch it and things go crazy and they get bought out for ridiculous amounts of money. And, um, but it's all free to start with. Part of it is the collaboration model. Um, that Python has. Um, so there's a general principle that it's easier to find bugs when you have more people looking at it, and it's easier to fix bugs when you have more people with their hands on working on fixing them. Now, obviously, this is not an absolute guarantee that all bugs will be found and all bugs will be fixed. Um, there's certainly been enough in the past year, Heartbleed and the Bash, yes, exactly, shell shock to make us realize that there are, in fact, bugs out there and we really have to be paying attention to it. But I think it's probably pretty important to realize that proprietary software does not have fewer bugs. You may not see them announced as broadly because the companies may be keeping lockdown secret about the bugs that they found and that they fixed. Um, but the bugs are there. And personally, I find it a little bit scarier to have the bugs that you can't see and that you know, you don't have people scanning for, um, and that massive numbers of intelligent people don't even have access to. I find that scarier than, than the open source bugs where at least someone is going to find it. So one of the things about Python is, is that it provides, so with Python as a language, but also the set of libraries, it's a very good foundation for just about anything that you want to build on top of it. And I mentioned before, so all of this kind of combines together to give us uh, a way of innovating more rapidly and in just about any space. That's the interesting thing. So it could be client, it could be server, it could be um, it could be in the very infrastructure of the plumbing itself. Ansible is written in Python. It could be in the tools that we use to increase automation. There's a, um, in game theory, 
there's a concept of gaming. Uh, there's one, there's, there's several models of gaming, but there's one particularly that I find appropriate for, for free software projects, uh, and that is the concept of the, the zero-sum game. So the idea of a zero-sum game is that there is a limited amount of resources, and that you win the game by stealing resources from other people, right? So this is kind of, this is kind of the idea that proprietary software has. You know, it's like there's only so many operating system users in the world, and therefore we have to steal all the operating system users for Microsoft because that's the way you win the game. Um, so there's an alternate view of in gaming theory, and that is you win by creating value. So instead of starting with a limited number of resources, um, you start with nothing, and you create value as you go along, and the person who creates the most value is the one who wins the game. This is much more the model we follow in, in free software. Um, and in fact, um, you can give away that value. Like, that's, that's not the key piece. Um, the key piece is, is um, essentially building up the entire ecosystem um, so that it can move ahead more rapidly. Now, there's another side of free software, and it's the side that people sometimes find scary, and that is the concept of zero-dollar software. Well, okay, once upon a time, it was, it was scary and radical. It's actually not so scary and radical anymore. So in the modern day, you know, it used to be you pay $300 for your, your copy of, of whatever application on, on Windows or, or Mac OS. And now, people expect $2 software on, on the App Store. You know, that's what they expect. And, and this is not just, you know, a little throwaway app. This is like a fully featured, um, uh, like, office suite application. Yeah, $2. A very complicated game, $2. Um, so this is, it's interesting, this shift has created a market pressure on the companies that used to make money by selling licenses to software. Um, there was an interesting trend, so for a long time, uh, Mac OS, you know, if you wanted to update your copy of the operating system, um, you would have to pay hundreds of dollars, you know. A few years ago they did sort of a pilot of, of, well, let's just charge $29.99 for the update and see what happens. Um, it, it did wonders. It was actually really good for them because instead of having to support a whole bunch of versions of Mac OS back to the dawn of time, they had more people updating, so it was actually reduced their maintenance load because they could mostly just focus on the most recent versions. So then they went to down to $19.99 because, hey, that worked pretty well last time. Let's try it again. And then $14.99. Um, so the interesting thing was, at that point, Windows started to realize that they were kind of getting cut out of the market here by still charging hundreds of dollars for their updates. So they gave their updates for $14.99. And now, Apple is giving iOS updates completely for free. Hmm, interesting that. I think we've been there before. So what these companies are realizing is something that free software has known for a really long time, which is the way to make money off of software is not by selling licenses. The way to make money off of software is by offering support services um, uh, or additional services like uh, cloud hosting of user data to go with your operating system. Don't sell them the operating system. Sell them the other stuff that goes on top of it or content, sell them music, sell them movies, sell them books. And in this, in this market, free software, open source, fits perfectly. There's absolutely no, no conflict. Give away the software, sure. That's, that's not where the value is. The value is in everything that rides on top of the software. So where are we heading with all of this? So I think one of the things to carry away from the cloud and the move towards the Internet of Things is that software, you know, for a long time we were moving towards software that was, that was like more and more monolithic. And we're, we're now we're heading in completely the opposite direction. So software has to be smaller, lighter, and faster. So for a long time, um, Java kind of sneered at Python because of the GIL, uh, Global Interpreter Lock, because you know, Java had this really big, 
beefy garbage collector and you know it could do um, parallel garbage collection and well that's great in an environment where you're running one really massive server that consumes all of the memory and all of the CPUs. Um, Java is actually really awful in the cloud because it's such a hog and it takes so long to start up. And you know what? The gill doesn't matter anymore. Like, it's fine. You can have a global interpreter lock. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter because your multiprocessing is not in a single machine. Your multiprocessing model is now uh, a very lightweight process on one VM that talks to a bunch of other lightweight processes on other VMs. Uh, so it's, it's distributed in a different way. And that changes your optimization model entirely. So, okay, so this is the direction Python is heading, potentially. This is something we have to think about in the next decade. What can you do? Honestly, a lot of it is just keep doing exactly what you're doing, right? Uh, keep using Python within your web applications, within your server applications. Uh, keep working on the maintenance of the Python core. If you do that, that's a great way to help out. Think about Python 3, please. Um, I, I realize this transition has been a hard one, but there are some key feature advantages in Python 3 that are worthwhile. You know, things like function signatures and async I.O. and, you know, uh, Unicode support that is a lot less broken. Um, they're not exciting features, but if nothing else, um, think about right now the fact that people have to, like when they're considering Python as a language for implementation, they have to worry about this two to three. They have to worry about, okay, which libraries are supported in three, which libraries are supported in two, which, you know, how do I write my code so that I can handle both? It's actually a level of complexity that hurts adoption of the language. Um, so if, if nothing else, just port your code to Python three. Um, if you have dependencies that your code needs, see if you can help out porting those to Python 3. It's got to happen, and it's got to happen soon. Another way I mentioned at the beginning, uh, so one of the ways that Python gets distributed easily is by packages in Linux distributions. So, you know, if you're not like a core Python maintainer, but you have an interest in and uh, seeing Python modules more available. The core, the core of Python is, is in fact already packaged on all the major Linux distributions. You don't have to worry about that. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of long tail modules that are really, really useful that may not be packaged yet. And packaging is really easy work. It's like essentially uh, putting together a metadata file that tells the distro where to install, and that's it. And, and these days, you don't even have to do that because they, they know how to read from, from your eggs and like your existing pi Python packaging. Um, if you know a little bit of Python, or you know a lot, or you're maintaining a package, or you're maintaining a module, um, make sure you're teaching somebody else what you know because you won't be around forever. And make sure you're learning what somebody else knows all the time. Like, don't just think, I know enough, uh, I know plenty. Make sure that you keep learning as well. And a very, very big thing um, is community building. So it's events like this, it's, it's participating in mailing lists. You know, like, projects like Python, they don't, like, the software alone is not enough to keep the project going. Um, the human connections are actually what keeps the project going, and there's been countless projects that have just fallen off the radar because they couldn't keep the community together. They couldn't keep the people together. That's the most important piece. You know, Python's been around for 20 years, first release, um, and it's gonna be around another 20 years, hey, maybe another 50 years, uh, which means you kind of have to take a different perspective. It's no longer you know, okay, next year, what are we gonna do next year? You really have to think about how to make it sustainable for the long term. That's all I've got. You wanna take questions? Hi. 
What's the biggest thing that you see currently missing from Python? Missing from Python? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I, it doesn't have, Python doesn't really have any massive gaps, like massive glaring gaps. I mean, I suppose the, the biggest things I run into are the little, little irritations, um, uh, especially, well, so using a language like Python for a, a code base the size of and complexity of OpenStack uh, presents some interesting challenges. Um, and I kind of wish we had better tools uh, for like profiling, uh, for refactoring, for, um, you know, it's stuff that you almost think of as a little bit of, they're almost convenience features, but they really make a big difference in large, large code bases. Oh, uh, there's, okay, uh, Mike on that side. Um, so here's a concern, Allison. Uh, there's a talk that you probably saw a few years ago at OSCON that Robert Lefkowitz gave where he um, talked about sort of the death of free software because apps cost $1.99 because people are willing to, exchange, in exchange for this very small cost, give up the freedoms that are the traditional free software, you know, freedoms that we hope for in this community and related ones. And, I mean, and it's not just the actual cost of it being $1.99. There's this danger, I think, that we lose control when things are on these other servers and we're just paying for the service and we're not having the freedom to control what the code does, and, well, I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, yeah, no, I, I understand the question. It is, um, it is actually one of the core threats in this future where everything is distributed over the Internet of Things, and um, I think, so the key piece here is it is actually definitely a threat to your privacy if everything you have is running on an Amazon server um, because they're not gonna they're not gonna hesitate or a Google server they're not gonna hesitate to uh, give the keys away to whoever comes knocking on their door and says they must give the keys away um, cloud is not just about running on Amazon um, cloud is a, an abstraction of uh, running data centers and that can also be your own data center um, so really the answer to that is don't use Amazon's cloud. Use your own cloud using a open source software like OpenStack uh, where the software is fully open and can be looked at by anyone, absolutely anyone, where you own your own hardware, where you can control it. Um, and that's really the answer is, is and, and you know, more than that, uh, the way we're moving with things like OpenStack, what you want is the ability to have workloads that can migrate across. So stuff that, you know, like, there's not really any great privacy concern for your static HTML page that's out in public anyway, and, you know, it, it's all public. Um, so you could run that in the cloud, but you may want to have, um, if you're a company, you may want to have, like, uh, uh, the ability to shift work or the ability to have, you know, sort of manage one set of infrastructure from one point, and some of it is spun out, spun out on a public cloud, some of it is on a private cloud, which is the bits that you actually control. Um, that there's another piece in there, and that is in the Internet of Things, um, there is a real risk of these all being proprietary things like Fitbit. Um, and you lose a lot of security and privacy and control if all of the little things that gather all your data about where you're going and what you're doing and how much you weigh and how much you're walking and all of that is all proprietary. Um, so one of the things that we want to be conscious of is making sure that um, free software is there, that we don't just kind of like throw up our hands and say, um, oh, we don't want anything to do with cloud. We don't want anything to do with this Internet of Things. Um, free software needs to be at the forefront, um, as it was at the forefront of the web and Web 2.0.
There's another question here in front. Hi, just a quick question on the subject of Python 3. Um, uh, I seem to recall recently hearing that I think the Python Software Foundation or the developers have basically decided to definitely end of life Python 2 with a, a certain. So is there a strong commitment now to phasing out Python 2 entirely? Because I think that's probably the key thing which has been holding back Python 3, obviously, is there's these two parallel streams. So, I mean, Guido are, we, are we reaching the point where Python 2 is going to be buried? <laughs> Guido has said for a long time there will be no 2.8. There will not ever be a 2.8. And he's been pretty firm about that. I don't know, um, David might have a better idea. Is, has he given a specific date at which 2.7 is end of life now? And, and Guido will be firm about that. He, he does not hesitate to put his foot in the ground and say, this is what it's going to be. He's good about that. Um, so given your experience with, with large projects and involvement in Python community, what are you comparing Python to other uh, languages and, co and surrounding communities? What, what key th like things would make the Python uh, community different and possibly, I don't know if you can even say that, but would, would those things, in your opinion, make the Python community more successful because of, are, are there like three things you can point out the Python community stands out because of these th three things? Um, one of them is, is Guido's stand from the very beginning saying that there is one way to do it. There is one best way to do it. Um, certain other communities I've been involved in. Um, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll make a big deal out of there's more than one way to do it, but that can actually hurt you in the long run because you end up with confusion. Of course, 2.3 Python right now kind of has more one than one way to do it, but I would say that's actually a problem. Um, another, another thing has been... Um, very intentionally being approachable to newbies. Um, that's, a, that's a big thing that Guido has always made a point of. Um, that's a big deal. Like you want people who, who come to the language to be able to pick it up very quickly. Um, and that, that hasn't hurt, you know, like Python has very advanced, you know, like NumPy, SciPy, it has very advanced libraries once you get to that point, twisted for a completely different domain. Um, but in order to just get started with Python, you know, it's it's a great teaching language. Um, it kind of gives you the training wheels in the very beginning. Um. Oh, I think we have, um, yeah. That's, that's all I can think of. I, I would say if there was one thing that Python could do better, it might be um, uh, being a bit more evangelical. Uh, being a bit more extroverted about um, participating in things that are not necessarily Python. I mean, and th there are some of us who are who like participate in other things, but I think I would like to see a much stronger presence by Python developers, the PSF, at completely unrelated events, at cloud events, at um, uh, Linux events. Um, that you know, sort of spreading the ideas of Python more broadly. Uh, I, yeah, over here. <laughs> Just a question about open source in general. Um, you, um, you've, you've compared the open source model versus the proprietary software model and so on. Um, but over the 20 years since Python has been created, I think uh, I've just noticed that, that there's been a trend um, where people are actually being paid to work on open source projects like Kickstarter um, projects and so on. A good example would be uh, the self-migration in Django, I think, was kickstart, it was, there was a Kickstarter project to, mig to migrate the package actually into the core of Django, for instance. Um, but my question is actually, how does this affect the future of open source in general? Um, would people still be willing to work on open source if there's actually other rock star developers being paid to work for, the, or do work for the open source? Uh, software, so yeah, that's sort of the one question. And um, also, how do you how do you handle when uh, when you have an open? This is sorry, the second part of the question. Um, if you have a let's say a really cool project, and then the guy who who's the main let's call the bus factor one guy, <laughs> he 
uh, leaves that project um, and then it becomes stale or the project becomes stale, is there some way you can tackle, is there a, maybe a strategy that open source can take to tackle those kind of problems and maybe fund fund something like that? Or? Yeah, I was just going to say, those two are actually related. <laughs> They're not separate questions. Um, so yes, there has been a, a shift since the beginning of free and open source software. Uh, where in the early days it was almost entirely volunteer and then over time you would see a few developers for a few projects funded um, and now you have projects like OpenStack where the majority of developers are actually employed to work on the software. There are a few volunteers but, but proportionally it's a very small percentage. Um, about 10 years ago we worried a lot about um, if having some people paid to work on it would demotivate the volunteers. It, it doesn't seem to. Um, so what seems to happen is, is um, the very first developers to get paid in a project can be attention. If everybody's volunteer and then like one or two people get paid, then there's like a, well, why didn't I get paid? You know, why wasn't I one of those people? Um, but after a while, you know, I've seen a project, even, you know, I've watched specific projects do this transition. After a while, well, people kind of get used to it, and, and you find that instead, the fact that there are opportunities to get hired um, means there's more motivation to participate as a volunteer. You know, uh, as a side, not, not that your only motivation is getting hired, but, you know, it's kind of like, well, and as a side benefit, you know, I might eventually get hired to work on this project that I love. There's, there's a chance. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't have the same negative effect that we were worried it, it might. Um, and then there is a, yeah, there is a, I, I would say the one that I'm most concerned about now is, is the, when the majority of developers are employed by various different companies, um, there's a new level enga of engagement that we have to do that we really haven't done in open source in the past, and that is, engaging with the people at the company who are making decisions about where those developers spend their time. Um, this is, it's something we're doing in OpenStack now and calling them the, the, the hidden influencers. It's like, yes, the, yes, you engage with the developers. Yes, we get the developers on the mailing lists and on IRC and participating in the developer summits and all of that, but where are their managers? And if the developer says, oh, I want to work on this, this cycle, this six months for the next release, do they actually have the backing from the person who is paying their salary uh, to do it? And, and if they don't, well, maybe we shouldn't count on that particular feature as much as if someone is actually willing to step up and say, yes, not only is this developer interested, but I am willing to allocate 50% of their time to that feature development over the next six months. And it's, it, it's tricky because you don't really want companies controlling the software, um, but you also, so you kind of want to bring them in sort of grassroots up, you know, you don't want like a set of executives at, you know, these 10 companies dictating what this open source project is going to do, but you do want to bring them in and start getting them talking to each other, you know, managers from this company talking to that company. So it's, it's kind of a new, you know, it's some ways it's the curse of our own success. We set out to make open source palatable to companies and we succeeded. And because of that, we now have developers getting hired and more funds going into to open source development but it does shift, it shifts the landscape a bit. And the second half of your question. Ah, right. Um, so when you have a key group of developers, could be one, could be a few, and they retire for whatever reason, this happens, you know, life happens, people have kids, people get old, people decide they want to move to the Bahamas, whatever. Um, it, there are, there are a few approaches, and one of them is let the project die. Um, that's kind of what's happening to Upstart. Uh, sometimes you just have to say, you know what, it was a good run, it was a good idea, but nope, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, and another is uh, find the new generation of volunteers who's excited about it. If there is actually a community of users, and this is part of why, this is part of why I emphasize apprenticeship. You know, it's like, if you get to a point that the leads want to retire and there's no one to take their place, that's a failure on the, on the part of those leaders for not training someone to take their place. You know, every single leadership role I've ever had, um, 
I have always, always kept in mind two or three successors that I am training to follow after me. People that I make sure they know what I know and you know they have the skills that I have and they could step up and take my place. Um, and I think that's important for everyone to be doing all the time. And, and the third one is, yes, funding. So um, OpenSSL is a good example of this. Um, you know, in that case, really the answer was, okay, we needed the Linux Foundation to step in and find funding and hire these people to work on it. Because it wasn't that they weren't interested, it was just that they had to eat, and, you know, finding money to eat was consuming all of their time so that they couldn't actually do the maintenance work they wanted to do. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Um, going back to what um, you said about um, there always being one way to do it and Guido's attitude, um, that's why I found it quite puzzling when he was discussing a PEP to introduce type annotations and static type checking for you know, contracts into Python. Um, what's your opinion of that and do you think that will actually ever be a part of, do you think it will ever come to pass? So I think it's kind of related to a concept of graduated typing. And um, that is one of the one of the limitations of dynamic languages is that um, there are certain optimizations that you can do automatically that give you really big speed gains if you can predict in advance exactly what types certain variables are. Um, so uh, annotating types is kind of an optional way. It's kind of like of introducing the potential for these optimizations without making it an absolute requirement. Um, and, and also it gives you some things like you could run in development without doing strict checking, uh, but in production you might do strict checking there, um, things like that. So I think, I think it probably will happen and I think it's probably a good thing. I don't think that's really, so I don't think that's really more than one way to do it in the sense of radically different options. It's just uh, introducing an optional feature that you can choose to use and you know it'll give you speed gains, stability gains, security gains if you choose to use it. Um, but it's not required and you know you don't have to confuse newbies with it. Um, so I think that's actually a strength of Python rather than a weakness. Oh, I think there was someone who stuck up their hand to ask a question somewhere over here. Yes? Ah. Someone could just pass this back one row. So I have a question regarding open source projects. Some open source projects are quite complex to get into. I mean, a very good example of that is uh, Mesa, which is you know an open GL stack. Um, there is like 20 developers working in it worldwide. It's such a big project, and the people who try to get into it just fail because it's too big. Um, this is what I consider like a problem with some open source software, as in a project got too too big to be managed or for volunteers to get into easily. So uh, is there anything that can be, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the question is either. How can we make this, do you know of a way to make it better? Yeah, OpenStack is another one of those projects that's just really big and complicated and it's hard to get into. Um, to a certain extent, Yes, there is things that we can do about it. You can work on simplifying the software. You can work on um, identifying, you know, like bite-sized bugs or, you know, like it's, it's partly a social change, you know, that the developers need to realize that this is an important part of keeping the project going for 20 years is having new people coming in and kind of having that channel for new people to follow so that they can come in. But it's not a completely solvable problem. So there's the, the waterbed theory of, of complexity, right, is that for a certain problem space, there is a certain amount of complexity. And, and I think, you know, for OpenStack, you know, there is a certain amount of complexity to managing hundreds of thousands of servers, right? It's, there's just, there is in the problem space. And, you know, you may be able to push down the complexity a bit over here, but it's just gonna come up on the other side. You know, like a waterbed, you push it down on one side, it just comes up over here. So it's like, there is a certain amount of complexity in the problem space that you can't entirely eliminate. Um, and I think Mace is probably the same way. But you can choose where to put the complexity. Um, and you can choose, 
uh, to say, uh, refactor certain pieces of complexity out to a library and maybe there's only five people who ever want to touch that library. There's certain parts of the Linux kernel that are like that. Um, but you know, uh, user space in the kernel is one place where it's like, well, we'll make it really easy, well, relatively easy to engage here and we'll encourage people who want to add code to the kernel to go there and not really muck around in the real deep internals of the Linux kernel. Um, so you can kind of choose to make those, you know, sort of either modularity or plug-in architectures or whatever, you can choose to make those choices about where to put the complexity. I think we're just going to take one more question since Alison has already very greatly answered a large number. Yeah, this is a quickie. Um, how do you reckon uh, intellectual property rights such as uh, uh, um, uh, copyright or patents is going to affect open source going forward? At the moment, um, yeah, so here's the, here's the problem. So, Every open source license out there, free software open source license out there, depends on copyright at its core. And yet, copyright, by its very nature, is kind of diametrically opposed to the goals of free and open source software. Um, so at the moment, we absolutely have to have copyright because that's the only way we have our, our free and open source licenses. Um, in the next 20 to 50 years, I hope, that we will start shifting away from these models to different models. Uh, and they know there's some, um, you know, Carl Fogel has questioncopyright.org. There, there are definitely some people out there who, who are activists in the space of thinking about what the future legal model should be. But I don't think, we're not gonna see any substantial changes in, in, the, near, in the near future. Patents are another one where, in a sense, they're even less beneficial than that we don't really have a way that patents are helping us make software more free and more open. Um, but we are kind of gradually working towards, like Open Invention Network is one way of, you know, it's like, well, okay, we have software patents, we can't get rid of them, but um, let's get companies together to kind of uh, use the patents they have to protect free and open source software instead of threatening it. I think the real question was how um, an existing open source project might be endangered by commercial companies hoarding patents, for example. Hmm. Um, so patents are, are a danger to, to projects because uh, you know, the, the, the recommended advice is don't look at patents because you get trouble damages if you knew there was a patent in the space. So it's better just not to know, which is kind of <laughs> not the best feeling. But um, yeah, it, it's, it, the, the answer is things like the Open Invention Network and, and also um, companies collaborating around, like in OpenStack, they make a very big deal of the companies collaborating around all contributing their patents in the cloud, ecos in the cloud space towards OpenStack. Um, and there's actually, you know, I think the only really major cloud providers that don't participate, uh, or cloud companies that don't participate in OpenStack in some way or another is probably like Google and Amazon. Like even Microsoft contributes to OpenStack, which is the weirdest thing. But, <laughs> you know, they, they, want, they want their virtualization to work in OpenStack as well. So, um, so it's, it's that sort of thing. So, once, so it's getting companies to collaborate around specific open source ecosystems uh, in specific ways that actually builds in the protection. Uh, because honestly, most of these companies don't use patents offensively. Most of them, like sort of the core idea of patents in business is a defensive model where the reason we have to have patents is so that we can build agreements with the other companies. So like we have a certain amount of weight on our side that balances out their weight on their side and that's what brings us to the table to talk is because you know we each need what the other has. So the fear, the reason companies aren't willing to just throw up their hands, some have, Canonical refuses to do patents, um, but the reason companies aren't willing to just say, no, we will not do patents, is because they're afraid 
it's like the Cold War, right? They're afraid our competitors are building up their patents and they're going to they're going to cream us if we don't if we don't actually have, you know, a, a patent set to counter them with. It's it's in an unfortunate part of of our world at the moment, and I hope it will die. <laughs> I would be happy to see software patents completely abolished. Oh, I just want to remind everyone, if you didn't get to ask your question here, or if it was too open-ended for you to be comfortable asking in front of everyone, um, find Alice and take her up on her offer. Please and do. Catch me over coffee. Uh, I'll be here all week and at the sprints. <laughs> awesome. And thank you again.